So we've seen that um, there is a lot of slack on the labor market. A lot of workers are always unemployed. There's a lot of slack on the uh, product market. A lot of goods and services uh, that could be produced are not produced. So if that's all what we saw from a theoretical perspective, um, we could just use a disequilibrium model to explain these patterns. Um, so if you have a disequilibrium model with a fixed price on the product market and excess supply, then you could explain why um, you have goods and services by firms that are uh, not produced or not sold. Uh, if you have a disequilibrium model with a fixed wage on the labor market and excess supply, then you can explain why you have workers who want to work but are not employed. However, um, the world is more complicated than that. So let's look at the labor market. On the labor market, not only do we have unemployed workers, but at the same time, we also always have vacant jobs. So unemployed workers and vacant jobs, they always coexist. And that's something that disequilibrium uh, model cannot explain, because in the disequilibrium model, um, the amount of um, stuff that's traded is always the minimum of the demand and supply. So that means that either you have unemployed workers and no vacant jobs, or you have vacant jobs and no unemployed workers. In a disequilibrium framework, you cannot have both. But what, what we'll see um, here is that actually there are always jobs that are vacant at the same time that there are workers that are unemployed. And it's because of this coexistence of vacant job and unemployed workers that we have to move away from the disequilibrium framework and try to develop uh, a new framework uh, of Slack or use a, a more modern framework of Slack that can uh, explain both uh, describe both the presence of vacant jobs and unemployed workers in the labor market, and it be the same on the product market. We'll have both um, goods and services that are not sold, and goods and you know a consumption of goods and services that's not uh, fulfilled. Both of these things are going to coexist, um, and because these things coexist on the labor market and on the product market. We'll have to move away from this equilibrium and towards the matching framework because the matching framework will be able to explain the coexistence of these things. Um, so how many vacant jobs exactly do we have in the US? So we have data on that and we can look at it. Um, so uh, first question, uh, I guess, is uh, what's a vacant job? And how can it be measured? Uh, so we'll see that the definition of a vacant job is actually parallel to the definition of, uh, of an unemployed worker. Um, so a job is going to be vacant under three conditions. Um, first, um, a specific position uh, exists uh, and there is work available for that position. Okay, so if we go back to the definition of an unemployed worker, that's kind of the same criteria as when we said that a worker to be unemployed has to be uh, ready to work. So here it's the same, a job to be vacant of course, it has to exist, and th there must be work that's available um, for that job. Okay. Um, secondly, um, so not only there is work that's available, um, but in addition, that job could start within 30, day 30 days. Okay, um, so the first thing is that there is work available, so this is the same as for an unemployed, an unemployed uh, wants to work. Um, the second condition is the job could start within 30 days. This is the same as when we said that an unemployed 
not only they have to want to work, but they have to also be ready to work. Um, so for the vacancies, it's the same. The job has to be uh, able to start in the 30 days. And then there is a third criterion. And that criterion is that there is active recruiting. For that position, uh, for workers from outside the establishment in question. So, um, internal vacancies, you know, when a worker moves from one position to another position, are not counted here. Here we are looking only at um, vacant jobs where uh, firms are trying to fill that position with workers from outside, or at, at least are recruiting workers from outside. So this criterion is very much the same as when we said that for to be unemployed, you have to be actively, you, you need to have been actively searching for a job in the past four weeks. So this is the same. There must be active recruiting for workers from the outside for that position. Um, so there is work available, it could start within 30 days, there is active recruiting. Once all these criteria are satisfied, then you have a vacant job. Uh, and so how many vacant jobs are there in the US? So again, the data, are available on, uh, on, uh, on the freight database. Uh, and these data, they come from um, the job openings and labor turnover survey, which is known as JOLTS. Uh, so here are the data from JOLTS, uh, and JOLTS is administered, you know, the same way that the CPS that gets us the unemployment data is administered by the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. JOLTS is also administered by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So here we have the data uh, from JOLTS. This is uh, job openings in all industries. Um, so actually, these data, it's interesting, you know, unemployment data have been available since just the end of World War II, so 1948, and we had from, some data from before that. Um, but um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has uh, been looking at uh, vacancies only uh, in a more recent period. Um, so the BLS data, you can see here, they only start in 2000. Okay. So this is a more recent data set. Uh, so what do we see here? Uh, so on the y-axis, this is a rate. So you can see between 1% and 8%. So a rate, uh, so you can wonder like this job openings is as a share of what? And that's a good question. So actually, that's a sh this rate here, it's a share of employment plus vacant jobs. So you take all, uh, so I guess I should say, uh, it's measuring vacant job as a share of all field jobs plus vacant jobs. So you take all the jobs that exist, all the jobs that are vacant, uh, and then as a fraction of that, how many of these jobs are vacant? That's how the uh, BLS report these numbers, okay? Um, and so what, what we can see, uh, so first of all, we can see that there are always vacant jobs. Okay, so it's not an aberration that happens only in good times. At any point in time, there are vacant jobs. Um, so in fact, you know, if you took the mean here of this series, uh, you would get 3.4%. Uh, Okay, uh, so that's the number of vacant jobs as a fraction of, if you want, total jobs, both field and uh, vacant. So out of all the jobs out there, 3.4% uh, are vacant. So it's quite a significant number. It's a bit below the rate of unemployment, but nevertheless, uh, it's quite a big number. So you can see that also uh, there is a clear cyclicality. Um, so you can see that in good times, the number of vacant jobs tend to be high. So here uh, you can see it you know, just before, uh, you know, just before the Great Recession, you had a lot of vacant jobs, you know, around like 
3.5%. You can see it just before uh, you can see just before the dot com uh, bubble burst. You also had almost 4% of all jobs were vacant. Then you can and then you can see it, of course, um, today where we have a uh, almost seven percent around seven percent of all jobs uh, are vacant so it's very large uh, amount of vacancy so the labor market is very very hot these days uh, in the aftermath uh, of the pandemic um, and so in good times you see a lot of vacant jobs and in bad times you see very uh, fewer vacant jobs so for a good example of that would be in the aftermath of the great recession here where you had less than two um, percent uh, of jobs that were vacant so actually um, the minimum is 1.7 percent um, so clear cyclicality uh, the number of vacant jobs um, is very pro-cyclical it's high in good time and slow in bad times uh, Okay, so um, it moved in exactly the opposite way as the unemployment rate. Where uh, so when you can see it here, when the unemployment rate is high, the rate of vacant jobs is very low. When the unemployment rate is low, the rate of vacant jobs is very high. Uh, so um, they are negatively um, correlated. Nevertheless, at any point in time, you have unemployed workers, and at any point in time, you have vacant jobs. Uh, so. These are the data that come uh, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Before that, as I said, we don't have official uh, vacancies um, data that are produced by the government. However, there are other organizations that have been computing, uh, measuring uh, vacancy data before that. And in fact, um, we can go back quite far in time. So if you're interested in this earlier period to see what was going on in terms of vacancies. Um, so let me just um, show you an example of that. Uh, we can find more historical data. And vacant jobs. So the data that I'm going to show you here, again, are stored by the National Bureau of Economic Research, the NBER, um, but they are not produced by them. These are data that they've collected from other primary sources. Um, and uh, you can have access to them on FRED. So this, what this is showing you is an index of um, help-wanted advertising in newspapers. Uh, so this is just looking at how many help-wanted ads uh, there are in newspapers across the U.S. Uh, so this is not really, you know, it's not as accurate as what I've just showed you. It's not telling you how many jobs are vacant, but it's a measure, you know, because firms are only posted help-wanted ads when they are looking for workers to fill their positions. So this is a measure that some jobs are indeed vacant and firms are indeed trying to recruit workers from outside to fill these vacant jobs. Um, and so um, these actually go quite far uh, back in time. So here's this uh, data set that uh, starts in 1919. Um, and so as I was saying, this has been uh, put together by the NBER uh, and it goes to the 1960s. And um, so we can see a couple of interesting facts here. So this is an index. It doesn't really tell you how many jobs are vacant, but it's, it's a measure of how much recruiting activity there is. And what you can see is that the procyclicality of uh, vacant jobs is very visible here. So before, before a recession starts, you have a lot of vacant jobs. You can see here before that recession, here, here. Of course, um, you can see uh, here, you can see it here. Um, although these data are quite noisy, but you can see that the good times before the recession starts, you have a lot of recruiting, and then you can see that once the recession comes in, you have a big drop in how many jobs are vacant. So you can see here many fewer uh, vacancies, many fewer vacancies here. You can see this whole period So this whole period here, which is the Great Depression, and 
and the following recession, um, where we know that unemployment was above 20%, you had very, very few uh, vacant jobs in the US, very few vacancies at that time. And then we know that during the war, which is here, when we know that unemployment plummeted, then there is a massive amount of vacancies, uh, and there is very little unemployment. So vacancies really increased. Um, but otherwise, the cyclicality is quite visible here. Keynes is historical data. And then um, after that, so here we stop at 1960. Of course, there is some time until you reach 2000 when the George survey started, but you have other uh, data that you can have access to. Um, and in particular, so if you want data for uh, the period from 1951, I believe, to uh, 2000, um, the conference board Uh, has collected uh, help wanted an help wanted index, both in newspaper and towards the end of the period in online uh, job portals to measure uh, to measure kind of recruiting activity. And uh, then what you can do is you can splice together the historical data from all these um, private institutions, so what the NBR has hosted, what the conference board has produced, and then you can splice them up all together with jolts, which measure a vacancy rate to create a series of vacancy rate for the entire period. And there's a very nice period uh, paper by um, uh, Nicola uh, petroski uh, off of the SFA and co-author that have created uh, that have created such a, a long time series for the vacancy rate in the US. And so here is a series that they produced. As a share, so I don't know if this is uh, as a share of, um, I think this is, so this uh, is measured as a share of uh, the labor force. So slightly different rate than the one I showed you earlier, but you know, quite, quite similar because the labor force total number of jobs is not that far. Um, and so you can see here they are splicing together all the different period. Um, so we can separate here 2000. And you can separate here, 1950s. So basically, um, all of the data here would come off of the Joel survey. Here, all of the data here would come from the conference board. And then all of the data here would come from the NBR macro history database. the one that I've been showing you. Then you can splice them together and get a sense of uh, what's happening with vacancies. But the bottom line is the same. You can see that you always have uh, vacancies and you can see in terms of uh, levels, it's between you know, three and 5% of all jobs uh, are vacant. You can see, well, here it's hard to see because we don't see recession, but vacancies are always very procyclical. Um, and the period that was a little bit, I mean, you have two periods that have been a bit of an uh, like very, um, not an aberration, but that have very um, high and low uh, values for the vacancy rate. You have the period around the Great Depression here with very low vacancies. And then you have the period here, um, just at the end of World War II, there is very high vacancies. And there seem to be also very high vacancies here at the end of World War I. So these data are um, available as well, um, and um, we'll use them when we study uh, the business cycle in the US uh, using our matching model.